Hello everyone and welcome to episode 14 of SSTO Space Program. Today we begin Operation Duna, which will be our attempt at exploring the Red Planet and building an infrastructure for upcoming colonization missions. We will send a research station and an SSTO to Duna for this to happen, but first let me fill you in on what's been happening behind the scenes. As you may remember, we deployed a couple of mining rovers to fight budget cuts we were experiencing lately and this was extremely useful. After just a couple of weeks we are looking at a budget of over 30 million credits and are right at Duna launch window. In the meantime, a new cargo terminal was constructed around Kerbin that will be used to unload our freighters. The station is now fully operational and waiting to receive its first delivery. I made a music video detailing the entire building process and if you haven't seen it already, please do me a favor and watch it. Our new Duna research station was also assembled in orbit already and has its crew on board too. We just need to send it to Duna. There is a music video about building this station as well, available through cards. Here we are at the point before the station was sent to Duna however, because we are sending more than just this station. Since this is a research station, we have five science laboratories that we will use to process all the data that we will get at Duna. And since we have also Science Relay mode installed, we can beam data from other vessels as well, thus making this station exponentially more useful. We have some greenhouses and habitats on the station, designed to keep eight scientists, a pilot and a station engineer relatively well fed and happy for more than six years. We also have an array of science experiments, scanners and antennas and two scanning satellites that will be put in orbit around Duna and Dyke, allowing us to get information about resource distribution and makeup of those two bodies. This will be crucial and extremely useful for establishing future colonies there. Apart from the station, we are also sending a regular SSTO to Duna because it's an SSTO space program after all. Our SSTO of choice is a modified version of Artemis, stripped of all life support to save weight, but instead equipped with a cryonic chamber to freeze our crew. We are sending Jeb, Bill and Bob only, and we will freeze them as soon as we reach orbit. You might remember Artemis from previous episodes of the series, and this iteration was modified to carry heavier payloads, has a cryonic chamber for free kerbals, and a semi-powered landing system to help us land on Duna relatively easily. It is almost 4000 meters per second delta V while in orbit around Kerbin, plus some excess oxidizer for more efficient landing and takeoff. In terms of payload, we are carrying a replica of Mars Trace Gas Orbiter spacecraft with us, an ESA mission that was sent recently to Mars, and a rather interesting rover that was inspired by arguably the most famous Martian rover, Curiosity. Actually, I'm quite excited about the rover and um, it has some interesting features and quirks, but more on that later. Once we reached orbit, our crew was put in cryo chambers and frozen for the duration of the trip. They have supplies only for a couple of weeks and are not particularly happy about staying in a cramped cockpit for too long, so it was a kind of necessity. Artemis is now ready to depart. Everything was double checked and I hope we are prepared for this over 200 days long trip. The onboard probe started executing the transinjection burn and we did the same for the research station. The station was designed with initial configuration allowing it to get to Duna on its own, but it will be slightly modified once we get there. Unlike Artemis, there are no cryopods on the station and it relies solely on its extensive life support, greenhouses and colonization module to keep its crew in good shape. As you probably know, Getting to Duna requires about 1100 meters per second delta V for the injection burn and takes around 220 days to get there. Time of flight will vary depending on your exact trajectory and indeed I end up with slightly different time of flights for the station and Artemis, but I actually wanted Artemis to arrive later. Anyway, both our vessels are leaving Kerbin now and since 200 days is quite long, a couple of interesting things happened in the meantime. First, our MOHO mission that we send in episode 9 has finally reached its correction maneuver node. The correction we needed to perform was relatively small, of about 30 meters per second and after executing it, we were at MOHO shortly after. It is our first mission to MOHO and as you remember we sent only two science and mapping satellites on a rather, let's call that, less than optimal trajectory. Because of that, our insertion burn was a whopping 4300 meters per second, but we are prepared for that, so we have more than enough fuel to perform it, 
Plus, the satellites have around 2000 meters per second each as well, so for any future or necessary corrections and orbit changes we might want to perform. One satellite is equipped with a radar and biome scanner and will be initially placed in a relatively low polar orbit around Moho at 300 km, while the other, equipped with a higher resolution altimetry scanner, will be placed in a higher 750 km orbit. Once the mapping is done, we can reposition them to lower orbits and get data from space near Moho. But now, there is yet another thing that requires our attention. Just a couple of days later, our Parker Solar Probe has reached its periapsis and, as you can see, it's awfully close to the Sun now. I must say the probe has a really good design and the credit for it goes to people at NASA, as it copes with heating no problem whatsoever, despite the heat shield getting to over 1000 Kelvin temperature. As you may remember from previous episode, we placed our periapsis below 1 million kilometers from the Sun, and that counts as low orbit around it, so after getting all the science data we could I beamed it to KSC. Unfortunately, in Kerbal Space Program most experiments are done only once, so for this probe its mission is pretty much over. But we've got some nice science anyway. Also, with MKS installed carborundum scooping can be done even closer to the Sun, so maybe it's something we should think about in the future. In case you don't know, carborundum is a new fuel type that is extremely efficient and extremely rare and super hard to get. Next, our asteroid mapping sentinel probe has also reached its destination and after performing a 500 meter per second circularization burn was placed in a roughly circular orbit between Kerbin and Eve, where the contract wanted us, and asteroid mapping could begin. It took a couple of weeks to map 9 required asteroids and before our research station reached Duna, we cashed in over 240 credits for this contract. Finally, the Duna research station has reached Duna's sphere of influence after approximately 220 days from the initial burn. Everything worked as expected and I was especially worried about running out of food or power because the station is solar powered, but well, it seemed okay so far. Upon entering Duna Sphere of Influence, two science satellites were detached from the station and their antennas, solar panels and other equipment was deployed and activated. On their own they can reach KSC just barely in terms of communication, but we also have a relay antenna on the station to maintain communication. This is important, as I said the COM network to be essential in controlling all probes, so it works almost as if we had remote tech installed safe for the signal delay. Nevertheless, we can't control probes if they have no connection to KC, and since they, they don't have an onboard computers that can execute maneuvers for us, this is something to watch out for, especially during insertion burns. One of the probes will be put in a polar orbit around Duna, while the other will be put in polar orbit around Ike. Both have only biome and high resolution altimetry scanners, and as you know already, uh, the respective scans are performed from different orbits, so we will reposition those satellites once one map type is done. The station itself was placed in an inclined orbit around Duna to ensure relatively good coverage of Duna's surface, and indeed with a bit um, over 45 degree inclination we had a biome coverage extending almost to the poles. But before that happens, we needed to perform an insertion burn of about 800 meters per second. This was relatively easy, especially after I figured out the right combination of autostrut that ensured our station would not flex, and at the same time not summon the Kraken and shake itself apart. Once we placed the station in correct orbit, the large round tank was undocked and placed under the main hub section, where its final destination would be. We still have some fuel left on the station and that will prove quite useful in the future. Once the tank was docked under the station I compressed all construction ports we had on the station and had formed a permanent connection between station modules. Next our station engineer went EVA to disassemble all RCS, engines and extra fuel tanks we didn't need anymore. This reduced the part counts on the station to just above 200 parts, which is rather low considering its size. It also ensures decent FPS and makes this station actually useful. Regarding usefulness, I've been collecting data from the entire trip to Duna and from orbit around it, and assigning our scientists to process all that data in station laboratories. This method, if you're not familiar with it, allows you to get significantly more science from experiments over time, instead of just sending it back to KSC for instant science points. 
Suffice to say that when Artemis arrived, the station produced over 2,500 science points already, had its labs full with data for more potential science, and a couple of non-assigned experiments stored in storage units. A couple of weeks later, Artemis reached Duna's sphere of influence as well. At this point, Duna Trace Gas Orbiter was deployed. As I mentioned earlier, this spacecraft was designed after Mars Trace Gas Orbiter, a part of ExoMars mission launched by ESA in March 2016. The actual mission also carried a small lander that unfortunately crashed into Martian surface. Here we have just the orbiter and that is a fairly good representation of the actual spacecraft, I hope as far as it's feasible in KSP. In reality, Trace Gas Orbiter performed an insertion burn and placed itself in eccentric orbit and uh, had multiple subsequent aerobrakes to eventually achieve a 400 km circular orbit around Mars. Here we will just aerobrake at Juna multiple times. This way we will not only save fuel, but also get a lot of interesting science data from flying high over Juna. And since this is a trace gas orbiter, the core experiment is obviously atmosphere analysis. The real spacecraft, however, had four major experiments on board, namely NOMAD, Nadir and Occultation for Mars Discovery, combining three spectrometers, two infrared and one ultraviolet, to perform high-sensitivity orbital identification of atmospheric components, including methane and many other species. Another experiment was called ACS, which stands for Atmospheric Chemistry Suite, consisting of three infrared instruments um, that helped scientists to investigate the chemistry and structure of the Martian atmosphere, complementing NOMAD by extending coverage in infrared. Cases Color and Stereo Surface Imaging System is a high-resolution camera, 5 meters per pixel, capable of obtaining color and stereo images over a wide swath. Cases will provide a geological and dynamical context for sources or sinks of trace gases detected by NOMAD and ACS. Friend fine resolution epithermal neutron detector. This neutron detector will map hydrogen on the surface down to a meter deep, revealing deposits of water ice near the surface and will be, this is interesting, it will be 10 times better than existing measurements that we have currently. Well, I hope that you didn't mind this absolutely shameless excuse to talk about ExoMars mission a little bit, but um, now we're back in KSP. After taking the data from the initial aerobrake, I beamed it over to our research station for processing. It was finally time for Artemis to perform its aerobrake and landing, but since we are playing with plasma blackout, meaning that we might lose contact with the spacecraft during a particularly fiery re-entry, or if a planet gets in the way, we needed to bring at least the jet back into shape. Freezing or thawing a Kerbal requires 3000 electrical charge, so I decided to leave Bob frozen for now. Our first aerobrake was relatively gentle and placed us in a slightly eccentric orbit and uh, we were ready for a proper entry and landing on the second pass. I wasn't aiming for any particular spot as it was our first landing on Duna, plus it is actually much harder to control a plane in a Duna's atmosphere, so to make it just a little bit easier I wanted to land somewhere in the lowlands because higher atmospheric density means better lift. The downside of that was that there are very frequent sandstorms on Juno Lowlands and obviously we had to land during one. I must say I wasn't very happy about it, but to my surprise we totally landed on the first try. Not that I ever crashed, but you know, it was still something and the landing system worked really well too. Once on the ground I sent Bill out to unload our Juno rover. It's a rather poor excuse for a Curiosity replica, but nevertheless, to maintain some connection to the actual Mars rover, I decided to use a sky crane to get it out of the cargo bay. As you can see, it looks like a very distant cousin to Curiosity, that is also related to Wally. -E. Bob was now back as well, so I decided to take all readings from our landing spot and after collecting the data, reset the experiments. What makes this rover particularly interesting is that it has limited power supply that will last only for about 1000 days and also it is equipped with an autopilot from the Bon Voyage mod which drives your rovers in the background. It sounds great but I haven't done enough testing before and it seems it turned out that the mod didn't recognize the power supply he had on the rover and considered the rover unpowered and refused to drive it. It looked pretty hopeless and um, I even thought that maybe I can drive the rover myself as it is pretty fast, but being an expert hacker that I am and somewhat familiar with modding, I decided to fiddle with the config files a little and eventually convinced the mod to cooperate. So yes, now the rover, 
Uh, it's not called curiosity, it's called endurance because I wanted it to drive long distances on Duna's surface autonomously. Um, we'll be able to explore at least a couple of biomes before we get our colony ship to Duna. Unless something breaks again, that is. But this brings me to another question I have for you. Should we focus more on one particular location, like Duna, or continue colonizing Man and Minmus first and uh, let the launch window come naturally? I fear that without the focus this series might become a little bit too erratic, especially with life support mods installed, but it's up to you to decide. Also, Artemis is still landed and we can freeze our guys again and bring them back to Kerbin, or let them wait for colony ship to arrive. What we shall do with them? Let me know in the comments, please. With this, I would like to thank you very much for watching. I hope that you've enjoyed and if you did, please consider liking this video. My name is Mark Frim and I will see you next time. Cheers.